This is the three question warm up for foundation six. So let's get started. First question, what are the stages that an embryo goes through between conception and the development of an inner cell mass? So immediately after conception, you have a zygote. Then the next stage is the morula, which looks a little bit like a mulberry. And then when the inner cell mass develops, that embryo is called a blastocyst. Next, what drugs interfere with microtubule functioning? So there are the benzimidazoles, like mebendazole and albendazole. There's vincristine and vinblastine. There's paclitaxel, griseofulvin, and colchicine. And the last question, which cell types are constantly regenerating themselves due to an absence of the G0 phase and a short G1 phase? So remember, a lot of cells go into a G0 phase and they stop dividing unless they're stimulated to come out of G0 and enter G1. But there are certain cells that need to regenerate rapidly and keep on dividing. So they have no G0 phase, they have a very short G1 phase. These cells are found in the skin, the hair follicles, and the bone marrow. So that's it for our warm up. Let's go ahead and get started with the lecture. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis, one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. Welcome to my first lecture. I hear you want to be a doctor. Well, follow me! You're going to see me a bunch of times in this course. And we'll learn all sorts of things. Biochemistry, cardiology, neurology, pharmacology, pulmonology. And we'll even look at guts. Yeah! As you might have noticed, I like intros. You know, something to set the mood for the lecture. Some students ask, hey Dr. Lewis, shouldn't you be more professional and serious? And I say, nope. But it's not all just fun and games. Sometime during this lecture course, the rigors of studying will start to drive you insane. Now the intros are here to lighten the mood and keep you from a complete mental breakdown. You're welcome. So strap yourself in and get ready for the most intense learning available on the planet. Ah! Oh, what did I eat? No, no, more explosions. Well, that was weird. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our step one video on cellular suffering and death. Well, it sounds kind of sad, but exciting. So the first topic we're going to talk about is apoptosis. And apoptosis is an orderly cell death process. And when we say orderly, we mean that we expect and actually plan for this cell death. It is a natural and needed process that serves to get rid of cells that are no longer of use. Now, why is apoptosis important? Why do we need a complicated process to allow cells to die? Well, if we let cells die in an unorganized manner, uh, all the cell contents would spill out and would then produce an inflammatory response, which is not ideal. So we have developed this process by which doomed cells are broken up into small bite-sized pieces, which are then phagocytosed by other cells with no messy debris floating about, and most importantly, no inflammation. So what causes apoptosis? Well, there are physiologic situations and pathologic conditions. So the physiologic causes will include things like during embryogenesis, so we don't all have tails or 12 fingers, a cell breakdown during menstruation, uh, there are proliferation cell populations in the body, like immature lymphocytes that we need to uh, go through programmed cell death in order to maintain a constant cell number. And then there's pathologic causes, like DNA damage uh, to a cell through radiation or hypoxia, uh, misfolded proteins that occur uh, due to a gene mutation uh, or exposure to free radicals. Uh, also, infections like HIV will induce cells to undergo apoptosis as well. So you need to know uh, the descriptive histological characteristics of apoptosis as well. And there's some weird words. So what are you going to see? Well, first, most cells are going to shrink. They're going to get a little bit smaller. And then something called pycnosis occurs. Whoa, what's that? Well, pycnosis is condensation of the nuclear uh, chromatin, which kind of results in a shrinkage of the nucleus. Now, that causes it to kind of look basophilic and darker. Now, you'll also see membrane blebbing. You'll see something called karyohresis, uh, and that's nuclear fragmentation. And then you're going to see formation of apoptotic bodies. So things are breaking apart into smaller pieces, which are then phagocytosed. Again, no inflammation is taking place with apoptosis. You're not going to have the red, hot, warm area that's going to be that classic indication of, in, of an inflammatory process. So with apoptosis, you have the cytoplasm blebbing away, and it's taken care of by phagocytes. The cell is shrinking bit by bit, and again, 
we're not seeing a lot of the problems associated with inflammation. So now we get into the tough part of apoptosis, the mechanism. Now but before we get too far into the specific pathways of apoptosis, I want you to know that the ultimate initiators of apoptosis are a family of proteins called caspases. They exist in an inactive form in cells and then when cleaved become active and they carry out many important functions associated with apoptosis. So that's the end of the story. Caspases equals apoptosis. Now I wish that was all you needed to know, uh, but let's go back to the beginning of the story and talk about the pathways. Now the two pathways are the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways. Uh, so the intrinsic pathway is what we're going to cover first, and this is the major mechanism of apoptosis, and it's used for both the physiologic and also the pathologic conditions as well. This is also referred to as the mitochondrial pathway because it actually involves an increase in the mitochondrial permeability, which leads to the uh, release of what we call pro-apoptotic molecules. Now, first thing we need to talk about is BCL2. So BCL2 is a family of proteins that closely regulate the permeability of the mitochondrial membrane. So mostly they act as an anti-apoptotic protein. Now, if there is DNA damage or another apoptotic signal is received, then another family of proteins, and these are the BACs or the BAX proteins, will go into the mitochondrial membrane and create channels that allow the contents of the mitochondria to flow out. So let's review. BCL2 is anti-apoptotic and BAX or BACs is pro-apoptotic. One way to remember this is that BCL2 uh, has four letters and anti has four letters and BACs has three letters and pro has three letters. And again, BACs is letting uh, the contents of the mitochondria out. So what's in the mitochondria that's so bad for cells? Well, the answer is cytochrome C. Cytochrome C will then start a cascade of enzyme activations that will end up activating what? caspases. So caspases will then lead us to apoptosis. Next, let's move on to the extrinsic pathway. So you can remember this because the signal is coming from outside of the cell. So in the cell membrane, there are two major receptors that can receive what we call death signals. And these include the TNF receptor, and then uh, probably what you'll see a little bit more often is the FAS receptor, or the FAS receptor, also known as CD95. Uh, so they will be activated by either TNF-alpha or by the FAS ligand, uh, respectively. Now once activated, the receptors will transmit signals that will, again, cause the activation of caspases. Now there's another extrinsic me mechanism you need to know, and this occurs when killer lymphocytes, so mainly cytotoxic T cells, recognize a cell as either foreign or infected or something funky going on. Now these lymphocytes will then release perforin and granzyme B. So perforin is going to punch holes in the plasma membrane, and then that granzyme B is going to enter into the cell and activate the caspases directly. All right, so let's go over this again in something I like to call Lewis notes. Hello everyone, welcome to our very first Lewis Notes, and Lewis Notes are what we're going to use some throughout this course in order to really knock home some of our uh, highest yield stuff. So what I like people to do is break out their own piece of paper and write in some of this stuff uh, yourself, because the more you put it into your brain, especially if you're writing it, the more likely that you are to retain it. So we're going to do a matching game, and you'll see me do a lot, a lot of matching games throughout the course. So here we're looking at our intrinsic and extrinsic, and we boiled it down to the most important stuff, and we're going to do a matching game here. So let's start with the intrinsic pathway here. So first we have the anti-apoptotic stuff. Remember, anti has four letters in it, so that's going to be our BCL2, and we're going to put that right over there. What about our pro-apoptotic stuff? Remember, that's going to be our three-letter one, so that's going to be BAX. So if something activates BAX, then you're going to start this whole cascade down. So if you get BAX that's stimulated, you're going to get an increase in what? Remember, this is going to be the increase in mitochondrial permeability. And you don't want to do that because once you get mitochondri mitochondrial permeability up, you're going to start spewing cytochrome C all over the place, and that's going to lead to a further initiation of apoptosis. Now let's move over, over here to the extrinsic pathway, and first we have our death receptors. That sounds like a cool band name. Uh, so our death receptors, the first one we have here is the TNF receptor, uh, and if that gets stimulated then you're going to run into problems. The other one that you need to remember is the FAS uh, receptor, also known as CD95. Now the other way that the extrinsic pathway can work is uh, through killer T cells, so those cytotoxic T cells, uh, and it's going to use things like perforin. Remember, you're going to use perforin here, and that's going to put holes in the plasma membrane. And the uh, plasma membrane is wide open for granzyme B to sneak on in. And that granzyme B is going to go enter in the cell, and it's going to lead to da, 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 an activation of caspases. And then those caspases are going to then promote apoptosis. So if you can remember all that stuff right there, then you're going to be good to go on the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway.
Now one last mechanism of apoptosis that perhaps doesn't fit in either pathway is protein P53. So P53 is a very important player in DNA repair. So if DNA damage is present, P53 will arrest the cell in stage G1 of the cell cycle. Now this will allow time for the DNA to be repaired by repair enzymes. Now if the damage is irreparable, then P53 will then activate mechanisms that will again lead to apoptosis. Now P53 is often referred to as a tumor suppressor protein because if P53 is dysfunctional, then this can lead to a tumor formation and a cancerous uh, problem. Now let's move on to necrosis. So necrosis is cell death that is not orderly death. So everything we tried to avoid in apoptosis tends to occur in necrosis. All the intracellular components spill into the world, and as you expect, this causes inflammation. So there are several types of necrosis that you should be aware of. Most of the descriptive terms refer to their microscopic appearance, but we also see these necrosis types in specific organ groups. So the first one we have is coagulative, and this is characterized by sort of this gelatinous substance uh, in dead tissue. It occurs in places like the heart, the liver, and the kidney. It occurs in low oxygen environments. So think of an infarction situation. How about liquefactive? So this is more of a, a fluidy, so a viscous fluid mass. It occurs more in the brain. And also think of bacterial abscesses and pleural effusions. So infections cause uh, a major inflammatory response. That's where you're really gonna see this liquefactive type problem. What about caseous necrosis? So this is kind of maybe a combination of coagulative and liquefactive, and it tends to look like kind of clumpy cheese, hence the name caseous. And this is seen in things like tuberculosis. You also see it in maybe systemic fungal infections as well. What about fatty necrosis? So this is gonna result from uh, the activation of lipases. So what do you think about when you think about lipases? Well, you might see this in things like the pancreas. And then we have fibrinoid necrosis. So this is found in blood vessels, and this is caused by immune-mediated vascular damage most of the time. And then we have gangrious necrosis, and this can be either wet or dry. The wet version is seen with bacterial infections. Uh, it's common in the extremity. So I always think of like the Civil War injuries and having to cut off limbs with saws and that sort of thing, really nasty stuff. The dry version is usually seen with ischemia, so it occurs in toes and feet, mainly due to arterial occlusion. So we've established that necrosis is messy and cellular contents are spilling into the body. If you suspect pathology in certain organs or cells, then you uh, can actually look for these contents or markers to see if cell death is actually occurring. So go ahead and look into your study guide. What cellular byproducts might you detect in the serum when the following cell types are injured? So what about if we have cardiac myocytes? So think about a heart attack. Well, you might see uh, increases in myoglobin, CPK, CKMB, and troponin I. So when someone comes into the ER with chest pain, you're always gonna check cardiac enzymes. So that's what we're talking about here, especially troponin I and CKMB. We'll cover those later. Now with skeletal myocytes, you're going to see an increase in CPK and aldolase, and again, myoglobin. In patients with rhabdomyolysis, muscle breakdown releases massive amounts of myoglobin, which is toxic to kidneys, so you can end up with renal failure. What about hepatocytes in the liver? Think of AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, and GGT. What about the salivary gland? You're going to see an increase in amylase. In the pancreas, you're going to see amylase and lipase. And then with uh, red blood cells, think of heme, which will then break down into things like bilirubin. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about uh, types of cell injury. And sometimes we refer to these as maybe reversible or irreversible injury. Now it's important to know the different characteristics of cell injury and what the characteristics of the reversible cell injury versus that irreversible cell injury. So with reversible cell injury, uh, which we usually uh, will see will be correctable with sufficient oxygen or maybe nutrients. And it's usually characterized by a decrease in maybe ATP synthesis. You might uh, see this with just some cellular swelling, uh, nuclear chromatin clumping, decreased glycogen, fatty changes of the liver uh, or of the cells. You maybe you might see this in hepatocytes if you go out binge drinking or if you have maybe a mild Tylenol or acetaminophen overdose. Ribosomal detachment can do this as well, so that results in decreased protein synthesis. And the characteristics of, of that are, are reversible, so cells can survive that. Now what about the characteristics of irreversible cell injury? So injury that your cell can't come back from, it's like they're doomed at that point. Well, remember we talked about this term before, nuclear pycnosis. So that's that irreversible condensation of the chromatin. Once you go down that road, you're not coming back. Uh, karyolysis, so that's the complete dissolution of the chromatin. Uh, karyorixis, that's that fragmentation of the nucleus. So if you're getting these things, that cell isn't going to survive. Other things you might see, maybe a lot of calcium influx, that's going to cause caspase activation, uh, plasma membrane damage, lysosomal rupture, uh, increased mitochondrial permeability, and we talked about that before as well uh, with our intrinsic pathway. 
All of these are irreversible cell injuries or processes where that cell is doomed to die. Now let's talk about in a little bit more detail some of the mechanisms of cell injury. We talked about them in general forms here, but let's hit some of the real high highlights of why cells die. So one big one is ATP depletion. So without ATP, really nothing works. You gotta have power to run your cell. And the major causes of ATP depletion are reduced supply of oxygen and nutrients and actions of, of many types of toxins. So think of cyanide toxin. Next, what about mitochondrial damage? We know the mitochondria is really important uh, so far throughout this lecture, and it's closely related to our first mechanism because the mitochondria are basically the suppliers of ATP, and ultimately this will impair ATP production. So the mitochondria have uh, an outer and an inner membrane that house several proteins that are capable of activating apoptotic pathways. So we've already talked about how cytochrome C can activate caspases uh, in the cytosol during that apoptosis uh, uh, part that we talked about. Therefore, if you actually damage the mitochondria, we're not doing it a cellular, uh, a usual apoptosis, apoptotic uh, process, but if you're damaging the mitochondria by some other way, you might uh, signal that apoptosis, you might get a programmed cell death, but you might just kill them anyway. So mitochondria can be damaged by an increase of cytosol calcium. Uh, you can also have reactive oxygen species and oxygen deprivation. Also mutations in mitochondrial genes are also another big cause of some inherited diseases. Another major cause is an influx of calcium and maybe a loss of calcium homeostasis. So ischemia and certain toxins cause an increase of cytosolic calcium concentration. And this increase in calcium can result in an increase of the mitochondrial permeability that we've been talking about as well, transition pores, uh, and thus impair ATP uh, production. Increased calcium can also activate certain enzymes like phospholipases, proteases, endonucleases and ATPases, which all again are, are going to have a negative impact on cellular status. Now here's one we haven't talked about before, accumulation of oxygen uh, derived free radicals. So this is oxidative stress. So free radicals can cause cell damage through membrane lipid peroxidation, protein modification, and DNA breakage as well. So free radical injury uh, can be created by a lot of different things. Radiation exposure, metabolism of drugs, uh, uh, redox reactions, nitric oxide, transition metals, leukocyte oxidative bursts. Uh, so some of these are, are desirable, like the leukocyte creating an oxidative burst, and that's to kill things like bacteria. But of course, things like radiation would not be a great way to encounter our free radicals. What about reperfusion? So reperfusion after anoxia produces things like free radicals that we just talked about. So this is actually a major cause of injury after things like thrombolytic therapy. So this is why we have windows for thrombolytic therapy, like in a stroke patient. So if you can catch the ischemic stroke within three hours or very early, then you can go ahead and give that thrombolytic. If it's beyond three hours or even beyond six hours or, or further than that, you can't do it because of that reperfusion uh, injury. It's going to be worse than doing nothing at all. Now there are a few anti-cancer drugs that can induce free radical DNA damage and that's what they're designed to do uh, and that's uh, always a positive. And because we've talked so much about these free radicals, let's talk about how we naturally get rid of them. Well, free radical degradation is produced through some enzymes that we produce. Catalase, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase. So those are big things you need to remember. But you can also see just spontaneous decay of those free radicals and antioxidants as well as kind of a general grab bag of maybe that decreases free radicals as well. So all these things will protect you against that free radical damage. All right, so let's move on to uh, looking at uh, ischemia hypoxia, and we have ischemia reperfusion. So we have uh, different types of inf infarcts, and sometimes this is referred to as red infarcts and pale infarcts or red and white uh, infarcts, and this is uh, uh, an important concept. So what is an infarction? So an infarction is tissue death uh, caused by local lack of oxygen, and this occurs most of the time when there's an obstruction to blood flow. Now there is a red infarction and a pale infarction, as I just mentioned. Red infarcts uh, occur in loose tissues with collateral, so collateral circulation. And that's like things like the liver, the lungs, or maybe the intestine. And this is gonna follow reperfusion. So after obstruction of a blood supply, uh, you're gonna see ischemia ensuing. Uh, there's not enough blood supply for the cells to survive so they start to die. And because there's these collaterals ar around, that ischemia is then rapidly followed by a reperfusion. And because there's cellular damage, uh, that increased perfusion becomes really messy. Blood is leaking into damaged tissue and it's causing that red infarct. Everything's red because there's blood everywhere. Now the other thing that might happen is if you have maybe an area of ischemia where you don't have a lot of collaterals, but that ischemia is there for only a specific period of time. So maybe a few hours, uh, maybe that ischemia resolves. Maybe it was an emboli that's been busted up by TPA or some other thing going on. 
And then you have another reperfusion uh, time period, and into that area we're going to have that, that same problem we had before. Uh, there's definitely going to be cellular damage because of that lack of oxygen, and then you're going to have blood going into the area, and that's going to cause a red or hemorrhagic infarct again. Now remember we just talked about how reperfusion injury is due to damage by free radicals. So when you reperfuse an area that is hypoxic, you're going to generate a lot of oxygen free radicals and those free radicals are going to induce even more damage on top of the original damage. So what about pale infarcts or wide infarcts? Well this is going to occur in what we call solid tissues with a single blood supply, not a lot of collateral. So what organs do we think of this? Think of the heart, think of the kidney, think of the spleen. And again, you're not even revascularizing the area at all, um, so you get a very pale infarct. You don't see a lot of blood in the area. Alright guys, that's it for the lecture part. It's time for that end of session quiz, so try to answer those, uh, those questions and then we'll go through the answers together. First question here, what histologic features are seen in apoptotic liver cells? Uh, so you're going to see, like with most cells, a lot of cellular shrinking. You might see that pycnosis. Remember, that's where that nucleus gets very condensed, the chromatin get all clumped together. Karyorexis, which is that nuclear fragmentation. You're going to see membrane blebbing, and then you're going to see the formation of those apoptotic bodies. Next question, uh, what substances do cytotoxic T cells and NK cells or natural killer cells uh, use to induce apoptosis in the cells infected with, say, a virus? Remember, they're going to use perforin first, and then that granzyme B is going to go in. Next, what highly damaging events can cause irreversible cell injury? So there's a bunch of stuff. So things you need to think about. A large calcium influx, damage to the plasma membrane, rupture of the lysosome, mitochondria permeability, a pycnosis, karyolysis, karyorexis uh, of the nucleus. So any type of damage to the nucleus can cause that as well. Next question. What cellular enzymes are responsible for handling oxygen-free radicals? So we covered this briefly. Remember those peroxisomes. They contain catalase, uh, which is an enzyme that degrades hydrogen peroxide to uh, O2 and water. Remember our superoxide dismutase. That's, again, converting those oxygen-free radicals to uh, hydrogen peroxide. Glutathione uh, peroxidase catalases free uh, radical breakdown as well. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the end of session quiz, and that's the end of Foundation 6. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.